Trilligator, music director and conductor of the Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra, and welcome to another installment of Virtual Virtuoso, our weekly series where we get to hear music from our musicians in the Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra and learn a little bit more about their lives. Joining me this week is our wonderful cellist, Becky Kutz Osterberg. Welcome, Becky. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah. So, Becky, um, just first of all, uh, how long have you been in the Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra? You know, I had to go look that up because I was trying to remember. Um, I first started off in the orchestra actually as personnel manager and was that for a few years and was subbing in the orchestra because at that time um, we moved to Colorado in 2005 and I started as personnel manager I think in the 0506 season um, wow. and there was not an opening in the cello section at that time. So I was personnel manager for several years and I would sub in the cello section and it wasn't until 2012 that I actually became a member of the orchestra. Yay, during my time. <laughs> well, we're so happy to have you. And um, it, was, it was really nice getting to, uh, getting to know you right when I first started as music director because you were the personnel manager for about half that first year of mine, um, yes. or maybe that first year or so. And that was, that was great working with you in that way. Um, so where did you move from when you moved to Colorado? And, and where do you live now? Uh, so my husband and I moved here from Southern California. Um, or most recently, that's where we had been living. Um, and now we live in Fort Collins, um, which is just north of Denver on the Front Range. Cool. And um, I'm originally from California, but I had gone for graduate school to Ohio, which is where I met my husband. And then after we got married, we moved to California for a few years, and then we ended up in Colorado. That's right. Well, I think that's another reason why we have such a strong connection is that we're both Southern Californians. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> in fact, didn't we once determine that we might, did we ever play in the same like all Southern orchestra? I thought we figured out that it might have been maybe even um, American Youth Symphony or something like that. There was right. something that I think we figured out we might have barely overlapped. Yeah, that's right. I think I'm a bit older, but, or maybe more than a bit. Well, it's wonderful having you in the Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra. And um, is there Tell us a little bit more about your background about cello. Like, when did you start playing cello and what drew you to the cello? Uh, I started playing in uh, fourth grade in my school program in um, Orange County. That's when they started and they um, start with strings in fourth grade and they introduced all of the string instruments and the cello just really um, resonated with me. I think I really liked the register and the range. I thought the violin was a little high. Plus my sister was playing the violin, so I don't think I would have been interested in playing the same instrument as her, but the cello, I was really drawn to it. And um, what I always remember is that my mom's first reaction was wanting to know if I could pick something smaller, <laughs> <laughs> which fortunately I, I was really glad that I did not because it really, I think, was my voice. And like I said, the register just really appealed to me. Um, and I think my mom really ended up getting to that same point, too. I think that was just her first <laughs> initial reaction, like, ah, oh, this is a really large instrument. <laughs> right. Fitting it in the car, going to lessons. and right. Yeah. yeah. And a larger instrument is sometimes more expensive. And so, you know, there's that factor too. But the school had actually some cellos to loan. And at that time, cello wasn't super popular. And they're like, oh, no, if she wants to play cello, we have cello she can borrow. And, you know, that would be great. And Oh, good. So, yeah. And then um, remind me, did you do your undergraduate at USC? Is that right? I did. Yep. So the University of Southern California, um, I did my bachelor's in cello performance there. And then I did my master's at the University of Akron in Ohio. Fantastic. That's so great. And do you play with other organizations, other orchestras or ensembles in the front range? Actually, I know you do. So I'm just going <laughs> to lead the question. Leading question, yes. Uh, yes, actually quite a few of them. So I'm the principal cellist for the Greeley Philharmonic and the principal cellist for the Fort Collins Symphony. Um, and then I, and those are, with Cheyenne Symphony, those are my three regular orchestras that are, that I'm contracted for on a, on a tenure track basis. Um, and then I sub with a lot of other orchestras along the front range, um, sometimes going down to Colorado Springs and sometimes in Denver, um, sometimes up in Steamboat Springs in the mountains, sometimes in Boulder, so kind of all around the front range. Um, and additionally, I also play um, in a small ensemble called Synesthesia, which is my small chamber music group. 
um, that we play in a lot of unusual places. We play a lot of breweries or wineries or libraries or events, festivals, things like that. Even botanical gardens in Cheyenne. Yes, botanical gardens, <laughs> which is a great place. Our- Cheyenne botanical gardens are a great place to play. Yeah, some of our patrons will remember you from that performance, I'm sure. Um, and so tell us a little bit about the music you're going to play for us today. Um, well, I'm going to start off by playing the Sarabond um, from the third suite by Bach, which is a C major suite. Um, and it is a very um, contemplative, meditative sort of movement and really um, goes through quite a wide range of emotions, actually. Um, and I, it's just, it's one of my favorite movements, actually. I think all of the Sarabons are, but in particular, I really like the Sarabon from the third suite. I'm totally with you on that. There's something so magical about Bach's Sarabons. I mean, all of Bach's music is fantastic. I feel like the Sarabons have special meaning for Bach, and I, I, I'm so moved by them. I love playing them on piano. Um, you know, the, the aria from the Goldberg Variations is just another way of saying a Sarabon because that's a G major Sarabon, but the, the Sarabons from the French suites, and they're just, they're magical. There's something about that three, four time, slow time, strong upbeat, sort of sometimes just, just all the different characterizations, the characters and emotions are amazing in Bach Sarabons. So I can't wait to hear you play that one. So, um, and then later on, we're gonna talk about some of the other pieces you're gonna play. We'll talk about them as we go. Great. Is there anything else you wanna share about the Sarabon before you get into it? Um, I don't think so. I think it's, I think with, other than actually, I guess I'll say this part in terms of about Bach, I find, um, I, and it's how I explain it to my students in terms of my understanding of my process, I tend to think about the Bach movements almost like going on a, a journey and it's a journey that I'm, that I'm guiding somebody or, or telling somebody about or, or even like a storyteller. And, but at the same time, um, I think the purpose of a storyteller isn't to tell somebody how they should feel or what specifically they should feel. I think it's to guide them into an area where they can then explore for themselves and, and figure out what it means to them. You know, because obviously the performer, the storyteller has in mind what they're thinking or what they're feeling, um, but it's more of a journey that I have my journey I'm taking and I'm hopefully gonna show you one that you can I'm find. I'm sure yourself. you are, I'm sure you are. This piece just creates a whole magical mood about it. And I'm sure you're gonna draw us in. And as we listen, I'm sure we'll have our own stories, thoughts, feelings, pictures. Well, okay, here is the Sarah Bond from the C major third cello suite by Johann Sebastian Bach.
Thank you, Becky, for that Bach Sarah Bond from the third suite. Now tell us a little bit about your next selection. Um, also keeping with the theme of Johann Sebastian Bach, right? Yes, so um, I'm gonna go to the first suite now. So he had his six suites that he wrote for solo cello and each suite is in a, a key for the whole suite. So the third suite was in C major and that was the Sarah Bond. Um, the first suite is in G major and um, every suite also has in the middle either a pair of minuets or a pair of berets or a pair of gavots. Um, all, all dance based movements as all the movements of the box we are based on, on dance movements. And um, the minuets, they're, they're all in pairs and there's a minuet one that's in the key that you're, you're established for the suite. So the first one will be in G major um, and feels like the, the sun is out, you know, kind of feeling to that movement. And then once you finish the first suite, you go directly onto the, I mean, the first minuet, you go directly onto the second minuet, which is in G minor. And mm -hmm. it's very much like the clouds have come out and it's a little more of a, a overcast, darker, stormier kind of day. And then once you finish playing the minuet two, you go back and you play the minuet one again, um, which I think creates a very nice, complete um, picture in terms of the story that you're, that you're telling there. Um, the other thing that's really great about Bach in general and about the minuets is he's such a master at having different voices and levels going on at the same time. And it's really, because it's a solo instrument, but you are trying to create the effect as if there's more than one person playing at a time, or at least different personalities. Sometimes you can maybe feel even a little bit schizophrenic about that, right? You're trying to be different characters and flipping back and forth between them and imagine the different conversations that are taking place. Um, and it's one of the things I also really enjoy about playing Bach. Absolutely, yeah, with those multiple stops that you do on many strings, it's like those lower accompaniment tones, sometimes you have to imagine them just ringing through as you continue playing a melody on top, and then they come back again and they move, and it's like fascinating just to follow the different voices that he has in, these, in, the, in the box, in the cello suites. Yeah, and he'll oftentimes use um, high and low registers. So there'll be a moment where there's kind of this upper voice and then a few notes that get inserted down lower and then back up and a few notes down lower. And it's just like this back and forth that's happening with two different, you know, people or characters going on. Right. Oh, I love that image. That's great. So this is Minuet 1 and 2 from the first cello suite by Johann Sebastian Bach. Thank you. 
one of the great things about this virtual virtuoso series is that we get to see more of the personality behind our orchestral musicians. Becky, thank you for your music today, but also thank you for showing us your house and some of your personality with this beautiful cat. Tell us his name. This is Sherlock. He's our really, really big boy. He's a big cat. He's pretty much, we call him the full body cat because he's about <laughs> the my upper body. Of course, I'm wearing all black. So with a black cat, it's very hard to actually see where they begin and end. He's beautiful though. Tell us about the other cats that you have and some of those other creatures that you have joining you on the, on the couch. Yeah. So um, we have three cats. We have Sherlock and then we have another all black cat. She's named Ari and then uh, a white kitty, um, all white and he's named Merlin. And we never really set out to have like two all black cats and one all white cat. It just sort of happened. <laughs> two black cats came first, which was great. Yeah. Concert black, black cats, no problem. And then we got an all white cat, which is beautiful, but I spend a lot of time lint rolling white hair. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, it's funny how you mentioned that because I have a cat and her name is Miss Bo. And she, I didn't set out to look for a tuxedo cat, but she's one of those black and white tuxedo cats. Oh, so yeah. she matches me in my concert attire. <laughs> have you taken pictures of her with you in your tux? I haven't. I, I'll, I've had her for oh, getting old. She's good. almost 20. And I've had her since she was like, you know, less than a year old. So um, I've had her for a long time. And I, all this time, I've always kept her away from when I'm dressed up, you know, in my tuxedo right. clothes. I need to do that, though. You're right. <laughs> yeah, I think that'd be a great picture. So and then I also have, um, we haven't talked about my yeah. audience that is sitting here. So this is um, in the corner of my teaching studio where I teach and where I practice and spend a great deal of time in this room. Um, and I have always really liked having um, an audience for myself and for my students. And I've also had teachers over the years who've also done that as well. And I think I appreciated that, you know, I'd go to play for them. And um, one professor in particular had a whole couch that he had across the room that, you know, and a lot of them were sometimes were gifts that people had given, which some of these, you know, and, and many of these have significance to them as well. You know, I have one bear here that was given to me by one of my really good friends. Um, that one's uh, uh, Eduardo for uh, Lalo, um, oh, was, really? who's named after. And um, actually, I've got Dr. Bob here, one of my minions, and he's specifically called Dr. Bob because I don't know if you've ever done Build-A-Bear before, but when you do Build-A-Bear, you get to put a heart in if you would like to, you know, when they're going through the stuffing. And I asked them, I had this sudden inspiration, if I think my husband might even help me come up with the idea, to put two hearts in because oh. I am a huge Doctor Who fan, like huge Doctor Who fan, and Time Lords have two hearts. And so Doctor Who is the Time Lord with two hearts. So therefore, Bob became Dr. Bob because this minion is also a Time Lord because he has <laughs> two hearts. <laughs> oh, this is so great. You know, this is the type of thing that our audiences never get to know when they see you at the Civic Center playing within the Cheyenne Symphony. Do you, is it safe to assume that you might have a Jarvis somewhere in the house or something like that? <laughs> No, no, I don't. But, but, um, but yeah, they, but they all definitely have the different stories. Actually, this guy down here on the end and these two little ones, um, they have their little shirt on them from Arrow Bear Music Camp. So oh, it's nice. the, the camp that I grew up going to in the Southern California mountains. And so I also always really like having my little Arrow Bear there nearby. So great, Becky. Thank you for sharing all that. Now, speaking of personality, one of the cool things about you is that you don't just play acoustic cello, you also play electric cello. And yeah. tell us about that and about the piece that you're about to perform for us. Um, yeah, so actually I have it, let me lean over here and grab it real quick. I actually have my electric cello right here. So you can get a pretty good look at it. That's awesome. It's just kind of the outline, you know, mm -hmm. it really just has the main contact points, including this piece here back at the back so that you can have the point where it rests against you. Um, sure, sure. And then it's nice because it's very, very similar. You know, all of the fingerboard and everything about it, it feels just like playing an acoustic cello and they just only have the contact points you need. And then it has all of the, um, you know, electronic mechanisms along with the pickup underneath the bridge, which is a full pickup all the way across underneath the foot. So it pulls the whole spectrum. And it's a really great sound. It's by Yamaha. It's their um, silent electric cello series. And, um, I really, I just have a, a great time getting to explore different styles. Um, in my group Synesthesia, we play, you know, different pop covers or rock covers or we do Celtic or tangos. Um, we also do some great klezmer selections. Our clarinet player is, is really awesome. Copper Ferreira, you know. Copper, yeah, she's played um, in the Symphony quite yeah. a bit. 
So she, she does a fantastic job on the klezmer. And so it's really, really nice opportunity to play different styles and having it be amplified. Um, you can also control different sounds and effects and volume and tone, um, just like you would with any other electric instrument like an electric guitar. Um, and what I'm gonna be doing today is I'm also gonna be using, I can't really get the camera to show you, but you'll see once you see the video, I have a, a looping station soundboard mixer. And what I've done is I have taken um, Smooth Criminal by Michael Jackson, which has been done by a lot of different um, groups and, and people over the years, um, including um, the, what am I trying to think? Oh, Alien Ant Farm was one of the first ones that actually did it. And then um, the two cellos and they were featured on Glee. Um, and my group Synesthesia actually plays a version of this. Oh, great. But I wanted to figure out how to try and do it without somebody else. And so I recorded it and some, done some tweaking and rearranging, kind of a la the two cellos guys, but I recorded it on my looping station um, myself so that I can play a duet with myself for the Smooth Criminal. That's fantastic. There's something about that song. I think it lends itself really well to string instruments with that, that rhythm. Uh, it's really, really cool. Um, tell me this, are you gonna um, use the same bow that you use with your acoustic cello? That's a good question. Um, I'm actually um, not, in part because I recently um, had a new bow several years, well, I guess about a year ago now that I got. So those actually happen to be I think, well, one of them is right here. Um, but yeah, there's not a, uh, you know, in, in appearance, you wouldn't think there's a whole lot different, but the bow really does make quite a bit of difference. Sure. This is the bow I'm going to be using with the electric cello. Um, it was made by Paul Martin Seafried, um, a modern bow maker, and it's a very um, heavy duty kind of bow, but also very light and well balanced. Um, and it's great for a little more aggressive playing, like I'm going to be doing in Smooth Criminal. Um, and the bow that I'll be, that I played on my acoustic cello which is also a really opposite end of the spectrum from being modern. We didn't actually happen to talk about that. No. That cello um, was made in 1785. Wow. Um, it was made by Benjamin Banks and is very appropriate to be playing Bach on. Yes. And that bow that is, um, is a hill bow, and that was probably from about the 1920s or 1930s. And it's a much lighter bow than, than this bow, and it responds very well for kind of Bach texture and style. Um, and I would definitely not want to use that bow for this. I mean, I could, but it really wouldn't get me quite the same um, power maybe. and rawness kind of that I'm looking yeah. for too. But yes, power for sure. Wow, it's so fascinating. Well, I can't wait to hear this. So the looping station, just so people who can't, you know, don't get a chance to see it, when you showed me a picture of it, it looked like a bunch of pedals. It was, it's like a pedal station for like an electric guitarist or bassist or something like that. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. And so basically you, you, um, you can do pre-recorded, which is what I've actually worked on over the last week is I've recorded um, the, the tracks to kind of go along with. And you can also do it live. Um, both are done by the same method. So basically I hit the, the one pedal and it starts recording and then I hit the pedal to stop recording. And if you're doing that on a live performance, which is a very popular thing to do nowadays with looping, then you could start adding more layers on top of that. Um, in this case, um, just to make sure that I could keep track of everything that was going on, I pre-recorded those, but I'll still need to trigger each pedal because I did it in sort of three segments throughout the whole song. Sure. So I'll still be kind of triggering each pedal to change to the next one. And this particular one also has some different um, rhythm and percussion effects that you can put in the background. So I also chose to add some um, percussion backing to it as well. That's so cool. I cannot wait to hear this. So this is Becky Coots Osterberg performing Michael Jackson's Smooth Criminal. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Becky. You know, we're so lucky to have you in the Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra. And, you know, I just feel so lucky to get to work with so many wonderful musicians in the orchestra. The musicians in the Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra are so special and they bring so much talent, passion, dedication, and personality, as you've shown us tonight, to the organization. And even though this time has been, you know, trying and difficult for so many of us, a silver lining has definitely been that we've gotten to know you and many of your colleagues in the symphony and gotten to visit with you at your home and, and get to know about, more about you personally. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed having this opportunity to do this. And I think there are hopefully some positive things like this experience and, and finding new ways to get to know each other even better that will continue going forward. I think this is a kind of series that, that should be ongoing. It would be great to have already done it. I'm so glad that we're doing it now. And I'm really thankful for the support of the Cheyenne Symphony and everybody who supports the Cheyenne Symphony from the audience members to the donors and patrons. Um, you know, we really couldn't do it without them. Um, and for me, uh, all of the orchestras I play in and the Cheyenne Symphony and all the musicians I play in that all kind of interweave because some people I play in multiple places with, um, they're, they're really a family. You know, we have our collective family of musicians and um, we're missing each other right now. We're missing you guys and being able to play for you and yeah. really looking forward to the time that our families can all get back together again. So true, yeah. When you make music together, you have a bond like nothing else. And we're really missing that bond. And one of the special things in Cheyenne is that I feel that we have a really strong bond with our audience too. They're yeah. so incredibly supportive and appreciative. And you know, there's just some kind of special chemistry there that I don't experience in other orchestras. And um, we're so grateful, as you said, Becky, for the support and, and the ongoing support of our audience members and, and other supporters. Becky, thank you so much for doing this. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share? Oh, just that I hope that everybody continues to be as safe and healthy as they can and that we all just find the inspiration and motivation to do the best with what we have and where our circumstances are right now. I like that, yeah. Yeah. Find your joy every day. Find your ways to connect with others every day. And um, thank you again for tuning in. From, on behalf of Becky and myself and everyone at the Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra, hang in there and stay safe and healthy. And 
until next time, we'll see you again on Virtual Virtuoso. Bye. Bye.